right, open your Bibles to Isaiah 58, or look up here on the screen. We're going to be reading from verse 3 and verse 5 as our opening verses, and we'll go back and, and read a bigger section in Isaiah 58. But as our open, uh, the children of Israel, they're asking a question, and they say, why have we fasted? And they're asking to God, God, why have we fasted? And you don't see. Why have we humbled ourselves? You know, often in the Bible, the word humble, in the Bible, it actually refers to fasting. So they're just repeating it in a different way. Why have we humbled ourselves? Why have we fasted? And you don't notice. Kind of, where are you, God? And God's response is, well, is this the fast that I've chosen? Is this, are you doing what I ask of you? And so we're going to talk about that today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this Isaiah 58 and, and of course, all the examples in the Bible of fasting. And Father, it's a, it's a subject we tend to shy away from. So this morning, I pray you would help us to press into it and help us to find the place that fasting should be in our individual's life. Bless the preaching of our of the word today, Lord, and open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Lizzie, do I sound okay back there? Am I too loud? It's good? Okay. I sound a little bit loud to me, but if it's good back in the back, then praise the Lord. All right. The title of our message today, we're going to be having the same title over the next, whatever, 10 or 12 weeks, however long we're in this. And we're talking about going to the next level. We're talking about going to the next level in spiritual formation in our spiritual life. And today we're going to be talking about fasting. So our title today is just Next Level Spiritual Formation Fasting. Hallelujah. Uh, and so we started this series uh, a few weeks back uh, with a message called Next Level 2021. And we talked about in your life, how do you move to the next level? And we talked about eight different areas of your life. And if you were not here, I want to encourage you to check that out on YouTube as well. Um, but here are the eight areas we covered and we have a handout for you. So if you missed that on your way out today, grab that, use that. It's so important. We're focusing on the spiritual aspect in this series, but our opening message, we focused on the other seven, and so we want to encourage you in those areas as well. Amen? Uh, we don't want you just to be superstars spiritually. We want you to be superstars everywhere. Amen? As Pastor Shane mentioned, in your work life, in your career, in your family life, in your social life, uh, we want God's hand and God's blessing in every area of your life. So check that out. That's where we started with these eight uh, eight areas of our life and um, how to go to the next level. And then last Sunday, we moved into this idea of just talking about spiritual formation. So for several we weeks, we're going to stay planted on number three. Amen? Because even though we care about all those other areas of your life, the, the, the most important to us is the spiritual formation. So we're going to stay planted there and try and do what we need to do to help you grow. So what is spiritual formation? You may be saying, Pastor Chris, I never heard that term before. What does that mean? Well, our, our verse for the series, we're going to read this verse every sermon for the next 10, 12 weeks. So you might want to memorize it. This is out of the Good News translation because I like the clarity in that translation for this. But he says, my dear children, once again, just like a mother in childbirth, I feel the same kind of pain for you. In other words, Paul's saying as a leader, this can be difficult, but he's willing to, to go through that pain. He says, until Christ's nature is formed in you. You see, I, I like that translation because it says Christ's nature, because we sometimes say Christ, and what does that mean? Jesus is in me. But what we're talking about here is the way Jesus is, the nature of Jesus, the character of Jesus, that you learn to be behave the way Jesus behaves. Can I get an amen? Y'all awake today? So that when you go into work, it's not like just some other person showed up, but it's like Jesus showed up. Amen? Do you want that in your life? That when you show up, the Holy Spirit shows up. Amen? That when you show up, the atmosphere of the room changes because you're there. Amen? And because you brought Jesus with you. And so this is what spiritual formation. We want Christ formed in you. You know, we say this with the little kids. Where is Jesus? In my heart. Amen? 
But we want Jesus just not in our heart, but lived out through our lives that people see Him in us. Amen? So that's what spiritual formation is all about. We made a definition. This is a Pastor Chris definition. But it's the process of becoming more Christ-like through biblical practices. Now, one of the things we have to be careful of as we start doing biblical practices is we don't become religious. Amen? So we don't, like last week's was prayer, we don't pray just to tick the box and say, I prayed today, or I said the Lord's Prayer, you know, right? We did some kind of religious thing, but that we become a real person of prayer, that we're communicating with the Father. Amen? And prayer, remember we talked about it, we're also listening to the Father. We're hearing His voice and He's guiding us. So, so we want these spiritual practices, these biblical practices in our life, but we want to make sure we guard against uh, just becoming religious. All right. So our outline for the series, we're going to be, we're going to have three mini-series within the series and currently we're on the internal. So we're going to talk about biblical spiritual practices that focus on the internal. In other words, it, it's primarily me, you know, my decision and my walk with God. Then we're going to talk about the external, the practices that touch other people's lives that are kind of outside of me, moving out. And so on the internal, last week was prayer. Today we're going to talk about fasting. We'll talk about things like meditation and silence. On the external, we might talk about hospitality, serving, giving to the poor. When we move then into the third one, community, it's like, what do we, what do we do together? Like Sabbath, the importance of coming to church, amen? And then practicing Sabbath in our life communally. And so we're going to talk about things that are, that are communal, that worshiping together, celebrating together, uh, the importance of those in our spiritual life. So, last Sunday, we talked about prayer. Again, if you missed that sermon, go online, you'll find it there. And so today, we want to take the next step. Amen? Now, last week when you left, I gave you a piece of paper. How many of you used the piece of paper? Oh, shame on you. <laughs> if you weren't here last week and you didn't get one, I've got some extras. So grab one this morning. But every week, I'm going to give you a piece of paper. You got to use the piece of paper. Amen? You got to use it. And uh, I really appreciate Sister Rachel. She said, oh, I, I like praying all those different prayers that are in the Bible. I never, never thought about that. And uh, I talked to her a little bit about a book. If you, if you like that and you want to pray more biblical prayers, there's a great book called Prayers That Availeth Much and will really help you in praying the Bible. But listen, if you didn't get this last week or you didn't do it last week, do it this week. But as we go into spiritual formation, it is not about, hey, Pastor Chris, was that a good sermon? Did I like that? Did that excite me? Ooh, ooh, God's going to do something for you. No, it, it's about what am I going to do? Amen? And, and I'm not saying I for me. I'm saying I for you. It's about what, what are you going to do? Are you just going to listen to me or are you going to kind of do what I say? So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but the goal last week was to take your prayer life to the next level. Did you do it? It's not hard. All you have to do is examine your prayer life and do something more or better. Maybe your prayer life needed something less, right? So all we need to do is take our prayer life to the next level. What do I do? Do I? Uh, maybe your prayer life's gotten lazy. How do I get it more disciplined? And so please grab this today. If you didn't get it last week or you got it and you didn't do it and you lost it, get it and do that and talk about how you're going to take your prayer life to the next level. Well, today we have a new one for you. I'm going to give you one today about fasting. Everybody say amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> this is probably the least popular sermon in all the church. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear this. Yeah, I'm going to give you this paper at any rate. Amen. And I want you to take it. And I want you to apply fasting to your life. Amen? See, if you want to go to the next level, you want to go deeper, it doesn't take coming to church and listening. It takes action on your part. Don't shout me down. Give me... <laughs> it takes action on your part. You, you got to say, oh, pastor said, let's take our prayer life. How do I do that? How do I take my prayer life to the next level? And you take some time and think about it and pray about it. How do I... How do I take fasting to the next level? Or 
Most of us in this room probably don't have fasting in our lives as a practice. How do I get fasting into my life as a spiritual practice? So we're going to talk about that today. So we want to go deeper. Um, and just, just a warning, I already told you, but just a warning. At the end of the service, I'm going to ask you to fast. Amen? <laughs> so if you need to excuse yourself now... <laughs> But uh, every week we're going to ask you to do something. Every week we're going to say, if you want to go deeper, you want to go to the next level, you want to go higher, you want to be a more spiritual person, don't just listen. Take our suggestion, take action. Amen? All right. Praise the Lord. Well, so this week what we want to do is... As we go through this sermon series, we don't want to do one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. It's like going up the stairs. We want to do one thing and add, and add, and add, and add, that we go up with the Lord. Amen? That's what we want to do. So today, we're not saying, okay, last week was prayer, this week I'm going to focus on fasting. No, we're going to keep doing the prayer, and we're going to add to that the fasting. Amen? And that's going to make our prayer even more powerful, more effective, more, um, I think, more of a sense of connection in our lives when we fast and pray. So, let's get into it today. What is fasting? A lot of confusion about fasting. A lot of people don't understand fasting. I think most of the time when we read the scriptures, when I prepared for this sermon and I read how many scriptures talk about fasting, I realized the majority of the scriptures, we just read over them. It says, oh, he fasted and prayed. We don't even think about the word fasting. We just think he prayed. And that's kind of an add-on. And we don't apply it to how does that apply to, to our lives. So let me make it real simple for you this morning. Fasting is not eating. So here's the definition for us. Abstaining from all food for a defined period of time as a practice of spiritual formation, i.e. to become more like Jesus. So it's not just not eating, not what we're talking about spiritual formation. That's the simplest. We can say fasting is not eating. When we're talking about spiritual formation. We're talking about abstaining from food for a defined period of time so that we become more like Jesus. Amen? Okay. So, not eating is simple. Every morning, most of us in here at any rate, every morning we wake up and we eat. You guys are so shy. You don't know what you eat in the morning? <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> breakfast. What does breakfast mean? Break. Fast. Amen? You're breaking the fast because you should have eaten dinner around 6 p.m., 7 p.m. maybe, and then you're eating breakfast at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., probably 12 hours later, so you've done a 12-hour fast, and so breakfast is breaking the fast. So if you eat breakfast, you're already fasting. Amen? <laughs> so you point at your neighbor and say, you're already a faster. Amen? But we want to take fasting to a different level, right? We don't want to just go, oh yeah, I fast every night from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. No, we, we want to take fasting to a new level and we want to take it with intentionality for spiritual growth. Hallelujah. So, abstaining for food for the purpose of spiritual growth. So an example might be, I'm going to fast for 24 hours. I'm going to take only water and devote some extra time to prayer. Because now I don't have meal prep. I don't have to meet my buddy for lunch. You know, whatever it might be. So I'm going to have a little extra time. So I'm going to use that time for Bible reading, for prayer, for other spiritual formation, meditation, quiet time, whatever it might be. We could do the same thing for three days. Or we could do a full week, seven days. Or, you know, in the Bible, it mentions four guys doing 40 days. Wow. 
I'm not going to ask if anybody's done a 40-day fast. I never have. I never intend to. Uh, but Jesus, Moses actually did it twice back to back. So Moses actually did an 80-day fast. And Joshua and Elijah. Now, let me just say as a pastor and the message today, we are not encouraging you to do a 40-day fast. The majority of you in here probably could not do a 40-day fast. If you want to do a long fast at some point in your life, and that's not the, the meaning of our message today or of spiritual formation, but if you feel led or you have some type of event in your life that you feel needs that type of devotion, then here's what you need to do. You need to plan for it to be three days and then until hunger returns. So at about three days, you won't have hunger anymore. But when hunger returns, it, it means your body has consumed all of your consumable fat and you're getting into a dangerous health situation. If you read the situation of Jesus' fast, it says he for, fasted for 40 days and then he hungered. He wasn't hungry the whole 40 days. It was at that 40-day mark that no longer was his body sustained. In other words, his body began to eat itself and very severe hunger pangs came up. The reason for the Bible telling us that story was what happens next is the devil comes to tempt him. So the temptation he had for food was greater than any temptation that any of you have ever experienced for food because he was in the point of starvation. Hunger had returned to him. That means severe hunger pangs. And the devil came and said, hey, turn this rock into bread, a nice hot loaf of bread. And Jesus said, I don't, I don't need to do that. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man shall not live by bread alone. So it was, it was to emphasize the temptation of Jesus there. And so we haven't experienced that. My wife la last night made chocolate mousse. I don't know if you've had chocolate mousse. Uh, Mandy Shane, you're coming over today. So there might be some by the time you get there. I don't know. There's severe temptation. But, uh, but nothing like what? Jesus experienced. So at any rate, uh, back to you. If, if you decide to do a long fast, do not try and do a 40-day fast. Do a three-day fast and then leave it open-ended. When hunger returns, you need to return to eating immediately. Can I get an amen? amen. Don't say, I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to do 40 days. Because 20 days in, you, you, your body might be finished. 10 days in, your body might be finished. Um, Guinness Book of World Records. Angus Barberi fasted for 382 days. Did anybody hear me? 382 days. He did take coffee and tea with no sugar and vitamins. He lost 276 pounds. Wow. Don't do that. <laughs> Amen? I don't want anybody coming telling me, oh, I did 40 days, or I'm going to try and do 300 days. Don't, don't do that. It is not our message this morning. It is not our goal. It is not our suggestion. What we want to talk about today is not fasting as an event. Oh, I fasted for 40 days. Oh, I fasted for 10 days. We want to talk about fasting as a practice. How do you get fasting into your life as a regular, normal, spiritual practice? Okay. So you might say, well, pastor, why should I fast? Why should I fast? Well, number one, Jesus expects you to. Jesus expects you to. Let's look at some, some scriptures. I think I got them on the screen. Matthew chapter 6. See, the, the Jews fasted. It was a normal practice. So when Jesus taught on it, he didn't give commands of how to like go and fast because he already expected them to. And that's what we're going to see in the scripture. Matthew 6, 16. He says, now when you fast. See, the expectation was there. Jesus didn't have to say go and pray because his disciples already knew they were supposed to fast. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you're supposed to know this is supposed to be part of your spiritual life. Jesus should not be coming to you and saying, you're supposed to fast. You're supposed to know that, just like you're supposed to pray. So when you fast, so Jesus didn't tell you to fast, he tells you how to fast. Don't make a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. 
For they distort their faces so that they will be noticed by people when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. I've been asked by many Moroccans during Ramadan. This is a good time for this message. Amen. We're right in the middle of Ramadan. (laughs) I've been asked by Moroccans before, are you fasting? Are you fasting? And I'll say, no, I'm a follower of Jesus. And Jesus said, don't do Ramadan. (laughs) And they'll always be surprised. Jesus said, don't do Ramadan. And then I'll say, well, he didn't really say don't do Ramadan. He said, don't fast the way you guys fast. That when you fast, it's supposed to be a personal, private event between you and God. You're not supposed to tell the whole world. You're not supposed to be bragging. Are you fasting? I'm fasting. Are you fasting? Da, da, da. It's supposed to be something very private and personal. And I think even within Islam, probably the way most are practicing Ramadan is probably not <laughs> the way they would, they would supposedly do it. And the next verse, Jesus continues and he says, But as for you, when you fast... Anoint your head, wash your face. In other words, don't look like you're fasting. Keep it private. This is something between you and God. Now listen, let me tell you in the church, we can talk about fasting. Amen? And if in your small group you want to talk about it and you want to say, I tried to fast three days, but it was really hard and I failed on day two or or I did a three-day fast. It's okay to talk about it. Okay? It's wrong to brag about it. Amen? Oh, you just fasted breakfast. I fast for three days every other week. No. <laughs> that doesn't make you more spiritual. Amen? It might make you tough. You might, you might handle pain better, but it doesn't make you more spiritual. So we're not here to judge other people. You can talk about it, but don't judge other people. Don't brag about it. That's what Jesus was saying. So he said, when you fast, don't brag about it. Don't make your face gloomy. Don't be like, oh, I'm fasting. No, you need to do your normal routine when you fast. Other than you have extra time that should be given to the Lord. So don't make your face gloomy. Don't distort your face. Don't try and be noticed by others. Don't try and brag, oh, I did a week fast. I did a 40-day fast. No, that's not what we're supposed to do. Wash your face. Anoint yourself. Look like you're going through your normal routine. Endure the suffering, the pain. Let that be private between you and God. And then in chapter 9 of Matthew, it says, And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the groom cannot mourn as long as the groom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the groom, Jesus, is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So when Jesus ascended into heaven, there's a declaration to the church, Church, it's time to fast. Amen? It's time to put fasting in your life. So, number one, why should you fast? Because Jesus expects it of you. Hallelujah. Number two, it breaks the flesh and the Adamic nature. All of us have a nature that is kin to Adam. Say amen or oh me. (laughs) The Adam nature is every time in your life you want to do something wrong. That's the Adam nature. You are born as a child of Adam. You are born with sin. You are born guilty. Amen? And so that sin nature is on you. That Adam nature is on you. But fasting breaks it. Amen? Fasting helps break that. And that helps, the Holy Spirit helps Jesus in you be more alive. It helps that Jesus nature come through. You remember our definitions from from Galatians there, our opening scripture was that it's to see Christ's nature formed in you. And so that's what we want to see. So it breaks the dominance of your flesh and Adam's nature. In Galatians chapter 5, it says the desire of the flesh is against the spirit. When it says flesh, it's talking about Adam nature, sin nature. For the desire of the Adam nature is against the spiritual nature. And the spirit against the flesh or against Adam. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. I don't know if you remember in Romans chapter 7, Paul gives a little discourse where he says, oh, I know what I should do, but I end up not doing. And I know what I should not do, but I end up doing it. (laughs) He says, so that there is within me a war going on. Because it's, I have this Adam nature and I have this Jesus nature and in no way do they connect. They are not like this. They are like this. 
And it's up to you which one's going to win. Adam or Jesus? You want Jesus to win? Fasting will help you let Jesus win in your life. Hallelujah. So number one, Jesus expects it. Number two, it breaks the flesh and the Adam nature. Number three, to help us to become like Jesus. In John chapter 4, it says, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat something. They always good to eat. You'll find that today if you tell people you're fasting. Oh, that's not good. That's not healthy. It's extremely healthy for you. Eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, Ah, did somebody bring him a cheeseburger? Did somebody make a McDonald's run? Where did, where did Jesus get something to eat? What's the deal here? They were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat. Jesus said to them, Here's my food. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. My food is not to shove something in my mouth. What nourishes me, what sustains me is to do what he asks of me. Amen? You see, until we learn to fast and break the dominance of the flesh, we won't get to that place. But if we want the Jesus nature in us, that's the Jesus nature. If everybody's going off to eat, but the Lord prompts your heart and says, go minister to that person, you say, oh man, but they're all having steak. Jesus, I, yeah, I'm going, no. But you say, I don't care if I fill my belly. This person needs Jesus and God's told me to go talk to him. Amen? And you go do what the Lord asks of you. Because the will of God takes dominance in your life, not food. And then number four, to deepen or intensify your prayer life. Also to improve your health and healing. To assist the poor and the oppressed. And to restore others spiritually. We're going to read from Isaiah 58 in the Good News Translation. Sorry, I don't have it in French. If you're listening in French, then just <laughs> translate it. It's kind of more of a modern translation. It doesn't translate exactly with the, the uh, Louis II. But the people ask, this is their prayer to God, why should we fast if the Lord never notices? In other words, everything's not going the way we want. We fast, but we're not getting what we want. Why should we go out without food if he pays no attention to us? So the Lord says to them, the truth is that at the same time you fast, you pursue your own interest and you oppress your workers. Your fasting makes you violent. You quarrel and you fight. Do you think this kind of fasting will make me listen to your prayers? When you fast, you make yourself suffer, you bow your head low like a blade in the grass, and you spread sackcloth and ashes to lie on. Is this what you're calling fasting? Do you think I'll be pleased with that? I've actually heard this verse miss translated by preachers that this is what God wants of you when in the verse he actually says this is not what I want of you I, I don't want you bowing low I don't want you in sackcloth and ashes God wants fasting to be a positive thing an uplifting thing it's not like mourning amen it's supposed to be something that energizes and gives us power and so that's what he goes into in verse 6 this is what we need to pay attention to right now this kind of fasting I want is this. Remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice and let the oppressed go free. What does he say? Be kind to people. That's the fast. What we mean to people? Be kind to people. Especially those of you who are employers and you have employees. Treat them right. Share your food with the hungry. So in other words, you fast, take your food you were going to eat and give it. Share your food with the hungry. Open your homes to the homeless poor. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear. And do not refuse help to your own relatives. Then my favor will shine on you like the morning sun. Your wounds will be quickly healed. Somebody say, Hallelujah. 
I will always be with you and save you. My presence will protect you on every side. When you pray, I will answer. When you call to me, I will respond. If you put an end to oppression, to every gesture of contempt, and every evil word, if you give food to the hungry and satisfy those who are in need, then the darkness around you will turn to the brightness of noon. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There's darkness all around us. He's saying, man, if you'll just do fasting right, that darkness will be as bright as noonday. And I will always guide you and satisfy you with good things. I will keep you strong and well. You will be like a garden that has plenty of water, like a spring of water that never goes dry. Your people will rebuild what has long been in ruins, building again on the old foundations. You will be known as the people who rebuilt walls, who restored the ruined houses. Isn't that a beautiful passage? Man, he's saying, guys, if you will just fast and quit fasting the way you're doing it and fasting what I ask you to do, that the fast is about blessing others, about breaking the, the, the old off and the new has come. You remember our scripture, uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone's in Christ, what happens? The, 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 your new creation and the old has passed, amen, and the new has come. That's what fasting is about, that we're breaking off the old, we're putting Adam away, we're breaking the addictions, we're breaking the cravings, and we're moving into the new. Praise the Lord. Well, you got to keep moving here. Are there types of fast? Yes, they're, they're truly, truly infinite types of fast. And so we're not going to go into all of those today. Um, but you can fast anything by stop doing it. Um, but biblically, there's the Daniel fast. Um, we did a year of fasting. So I have that up there. I think that was uh, 2017, 2018. We did a year of fasting in the church, and we asked you every month to fast something. So in January, we did the Daniel fast. In February, we fasted caffeine. In March, we fasted shopping and spending beyond just buying necessity for food. In April, we fasted music except for worship in the church. In May, we fasted games. In June, we fasted restaurants. In July, we fasted the internet. In August, we fasted our image. In other words, trying to make ourselves look good. We intentionally tried to uh, dress simple and not overdo it to impress others. In September, we fasted screens and devices, uh, mainly TV. Uh, in October, we fasted sugar. That was painful. In November, we fasted words, trying to be uh, as silent, not speak more words than we needed to. In December, we fasted books except the Bible. So I hope you were with us back then, but if you weren't and you want to practice this, you can put those into your life as a practice of fasting as well. So some Bible examples of fasting. Uh, we see in the Bible that fasting is normal and there's many, many fasts and many reasons to fast. So we see in Jesus' life that he fasted to prepare for ministry. He fasted for 40 days and nights in the wilderness uh, before God's call on his life to enter into his work as Messiah. He was obviously Messiah before. But after the 40-day fast is when he began his ministry. Uh, then we see in Paul and Barnabas' life to seek wisdom. They prayed and fasted for the elders of the church. Um, number three, to show grief. We saw Nehemiah. He mourned and fasted and prayed uh, when he learned that Jerusalem's walls had been broken down. And so he fasted. Number four, uh, we see that Ezra fasted to seek deliverance and protection. He declared a corporate fast. So today we're focusing on fasting individually. Individually, but also, Pastor Chris might say sometimes, there's been a crisis. Would you fast this week and pray over this situation? So that's what he did. He made a corporate fast. Uh, number five, to repent. Um, we see that Jonah uh, pronounced judgment against the city of Nineveh. And if you remember, the Ninevites were, were going to be destroyed. But what did they do? 
It says they went to fasting and the king de declared a fast for all the people and they fasted and repented and, and so God changed. Uh, we see, and, and I don't want this to come off wrong, but we can fast to change God's mind. Now you can't always change God's mind, but you know God's mind can be changed. Amen? There was a guy in the Bible, I think it was King Ahab, and uh, God said, man, you're so bad, I'm going to destroy you. And he repented and he fasted. And this wicked guy fasted and God said, okay, I won't do it. <laughs> I'm still going to do it, but I'll do it later. I'll wait till after you die. <laughs> and then I'm going to take the kingdom out of your family. And so, yeah, so God does change uh, when, we, when we fast. We can change. Now, not always. I, I'm also reminded like of King David. Do you remember uh, when he committed sin with Bathsheba and there was a baby and then the baby was going to die and David fasted? But what happened? The baby still died. So we can't look at fasting as like this miracle thing and, oh, if I fast, I'm going to get what I want. No, not always. That's not the reason we fast. Amen? But David fasted in, in hopes that he would be able to move the hand of God and have healing for that baby, but it, it didn't happen. Uh, number six, to gain victory. The Israelites, after losing 40,000 men in battle in two days, uh, the Israelites cried out to God for help. It's in the book of Judges. And it says they went up to Bethel and they sat weeping before the Lord and they also fasted that day until evening. And the next day the Lord gave them victory. Number seven, to worship. Uh, Luke tells us about the 84-year-old prophetess named Anna. And it says she never left the temple but worship night and day, fasting and praying. Anna was devoted to God. Fasting uh, was her expression of, of love for him. So this is kind of the one we want to focus on, is that fasting was part of her normal life. Amen? She fasted and prayed in the temple all the time, worshiping the Lord. We can find some other fasts in the Bible, like Daniel, who fasted for 21 days, and that was for a very specific event, right? He was needing an answer from the Lord. And you remember the angel came, and the angel said, hey, on the first day you set yourself to fast and pray, I was sent, but I ended up in this battle. And I think it was his fasting and prayer that gave victory to that battle and brought the answer to Daniel. So, at any rate, all right, let's move on. So today we want to focus, though, on what we just simply call the normal fast. The normal fast is abstaining from food for a defined period of time for the practice of spiritual formation that Jesus might be formed in you in a greater way. Uh, so how do I do a normal fast? A normal fast can just be one meal. Amen? But it needs to be put into your life regularly. So maybe it's breakfast every Monday morning. And Monday morning you have a deeper devotion than normal. You take that time and you set it aside and you, you pray. So some of these spiritual formation practices are going to overlap or intersect other ones. So just like fasting intersects prayer, fasting should also intersect one that we'll talk about in a few weeks, and that's giving to the poor. Amen? So as we fast, I want to encourage you to do this. As you set up a practice of fasting, also say, how much money would I have spent on food? So if you're fasting one meal, maybe that's 10 dirhams, 20 dirhams. Intentionally set that aside. Put that into a Ziploc baggie, and that's money for the poor. And when you're out in town and you see the poor, give it away. Amen? Don't give it in church in, at CIPC. Give it to the poor that you find on the streets. Amen? If you're fasting all day, depends on who you are, how much you eat. That might be 20 dirhams, 30 dirhams, 50 dirhams, 100 dirhams, I don't know. But same thing, if you're going to fast a day every week, put that money somewhere separate. Use that for the poor. So normal fast can be one meal, can be two meals, could be one day. One thing you might think about or seek to do is one meal, only having one meal a day. So in other words, fasting two meals, and you can do this ongoing, almost indefinitely. So I've been doing this, I do this except for usually Saturday and Sunday, uh, but for five days a week I usually do one meal a day. So I want to encourage you to think, think about that if that works for you. Maybe it's a, a full day, a 24 hour, and one way to do 24 hour, if you say, Pastor, I'm just not good, I miss one meal, I'm dying. One good way to do a, full, a 24 hour fast is from dinner to dinner. Amen? So have dinner at 6 p.m. Your evening, you go to bed whenever, you get up, you don't eat again until 6 p.m. Amen? 
It's been 24 hours, but your body can probably handle that and still feel strong and go to work and do all the things you do. So think about that. But what I want you to really think about, and I'm going to give this to you when you leave, and you don't have to fill it out right now, but would you fill it out today? Pray about it, think about it, and, and ask and make a commitment. And what I want to ask you to do, don't make a commitment bigger than you can do. So don't go, oh, I'm going to fast three days every week. Don't do that. Amen? Just say, I'm going to fast Monday once a month, or I'm going to fast breakfast Monday morning once a week. Something. Maybe it's breakfast every day for a week. But fill something out. Put practice into your life. Make it easy so that you can accomplish it, and then you can always grow that as you may want to. All right? So, the next question we would have is, when should I fast? Well, that's entirely up to you. Uh, again, I want to suggest you make a commitment and that you make it regularly. Uh, when I was pastoring in Florida, we had a Wednesday night service, so I would always fast all day Wednesday until after church on Wednesday night, and then, then I would eat. And that was just a good time for me to then have that little bit of extra time to study and prepare for service as it was a teaching service. And so I really enjoyed that at that season of my life. So uh, think about what might work for you and, uh, and when, when you should fast and what, what works. All right. So let's move on to uh, how to start. A fast. Okay. So you say, Pastor, how do I put this together? How do I start it? Number one, determine when you'll fast. So make a decision, and that's what your piece of paper's for. Make a decision. If you only want to do this once, just do it once. See how it goes. Amen? Like, I don't want to make a commitment I can't keep. So just say, I'm going to do next Monday, and that's it. We'll see how it goes. But do something. Can I get an amen from everybody? Can I get a better amen from everybody? <laughs> All right. Let's do something. I don't care what it is. Do something. So number one, determine when. Number two, decide how long. One meal, two meals, one day. For now, I would say don't do more than one day because we want it repetitive. Will you make any exceptions? If you are a coffee or tea drinker, I would suggest you go ahead and say, yes, I will have one coffee or one tea. If you choose not to do that, you will probably get bad headache. So normally if you're going into a longer fast, one week prior, you should stop all caffeine because otherwise you're going to have horrible, horrible headaches and feel dizzy. And So if you're a coffee, tea drinker, you might say, I'm going to fast, but when I start the day, I'm going to have one coffee or one tea or whatever it might be. Uh, I put there no juice because a common thing, I don't know if it's common here, but it's common for Americans in the church. They like to fast and they say, I'm doing a juice fast. But they consume so much juice that they're really consuming the same amount of calories just in liquid and it's really not changing anything for them. And it's really, really bad for them. We think it's good because we go, oh, it's fruit, it's juice, it's natural. But it's almost all sugar. And so it's very, very poor way to fast and will usually make you shaky and not feel good because your body's just running on sugar. So don't do any juice. One coffee, one tea, if you choose an exception. Number four, maintain your normal activity. So don't say, okay, I'm going to fast today, so I'm just going to stay in bed all day. <laughs> we see that a little bit with Ramadan, amen? <laughs> don't do that. Do your normal activity. Go through your normal life with normal smile on your face, normal cheeriness, normal routine, and, and, and allow that fast, any of that extra time then to be used. And so that takes us uh, to the next one, number five. Use your save, t save time for Bible reading, prayer, or serving others. Number six, give any saved money to the poor. So again, be very intentional about that. If you're going to fast breakfast, how much does breakfast cost? Intentionally set that money aside. Intentionally give it to the poor. Number seven, when you're done with the fast, return to normal eating and avoid gorging. It's real important if you do more than a one day fast and it's real important if you just say I'm going to fast you know breakfast this morning but then you go out and you eat three cheeseburgers for lunch right? Don't do that. 
When you return to eating, return to just normal intake of food. Now, if you're doing the one meal a day, that one meal might be a little bit more calories. That's not a big deal, but don't gorge yourself. Um, one of the things that happens when you fast is your stomach actually will shrink and you won't want to eat as much. You'll, you'll eat and you'll feel full. But because you haven't eaten all day, you just keep eating, right? <laughs> or you haven't eaten for two or three days. You just keep eating. But don't do that. That's bad for you. When you feel full, stop. Amen? All right. Okay. So, this is an important question. Pastor Chris, do I have to do this? No, you don't have to do this. I want you to do this. Why does Pastor Chris want you to do it? Because I want you to grow in Jesus. Amen? This is my job <laughs> as pastor is try and help you grow in Jesus. And so this is all I want to do this morning is help you. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. You're off the hook. Amen? Nobody has to do it. I want you to do it. I only want you to do it if you want to do it. If you're not ready to do it, you don't have to do it. But I want you to do it. I want you to come to the place where you say, I want to. Not I have to, I get to. Amen? My dear children, once again, just like a mother and child were, I feel the same kind of pain for you until Christ's nature formed in you. We want Christ's nature formed in you. Amen? We don't want... We don't want minimum Christianity. Amen? I go to church, I gave in the offering, I read my Bible this week. We don't want minimum Christianity. We want maximum Jesus. Amen? We want maximum Jesus in you and coming out of you on a daily, regular basis. In the highways, the byways, your workplace, your neighborhood, your family, everywhere. We want you bringing Jesus to those places. Anybody have, I don't usually do this in sermons, but anybody have any questions about fasting? You feel like there's something in your mind I didn't answer? Anybody? One thing I never heard of before coming to Morocco was dry fasting. It actually is in the Bible, but we don't recommend that. Amen? Take water. There's no reason not to take water. Not taking water is very, very dangerous. If you're going to do a dry fast, just like one meal, okay, or half a day. You go more than 24 hours without water, you're putting yourself in very dangerous position, especially in a, a hot climate. So, okay, yes, sister, real loud. Ah, okay. No, no, the, you, you take water as you need to. Her question was, is there any regulation on how much water to take? No, just to say hydrated. So if you feel thirsty, drink. Do not drink to try and fill your belly. If you feel hunger pangs and you're like, oh, I'm going to drink two liters of water. Yeah, it will, it will quench the hunger pang for just a little while. But what happens is, is you've stopped your stomach from shrinking. That's why you're having hunger pangs. But once your stomach shrinks a little bit, it stops and the hunger pangs aren't nearly as severe. So if you bloat that out with water, it's not going to last long, and, it, and then you're going to feel those hunger pangs all over again. So don't stop that. So only, but what I would say is just like your normal consumption of water, which none of us should be guzzling, right? You kind of sip all through the day. So you feel thirsty, take a drink. Amen? Don't get dehydrated. There's nothing spiritual about becoming dehydrated. The whole point of this exercise of fasting is taking dominance over our flesh that tells us to eat all the time. You know, in cultures past, when people ate, what did they do? They had to forage, gather food, prepare it, and eat. Now we have hanuts and grocery store and refrigerator and food that comes in plastic bags and is our cabinets. And we don't just eat three meals a day. We just eat all day long. So number one, it's not natural. And then number two, it creates a craving of your flesh, always wanting. And for our Americans here, it may affect others, but for us who are Americans, and I have a terrible problem with this, it's like craving of sugar, right? And I consume a lot of sugar. But our body's always wanting that. So if we go two, three hours, we're like, oh, I need a candy bar or I need a, something, you know, to, to put some sugar in my body. Um, well, fasting's about breaking that, amen? So that you're the one in control. So when you eat sugar, it's because you chose to eat sugar. And that when you eat anything, it's your choice. It's not because... 
you're compelled to. So, yeah, so the water part, um, again, it is in the Bible in a couple of places, but I don't see the spirituality of it or the necessity of it, and there's a real danger to it. So, um, so please do take water. Anybody else have a question? We have just a minute or two we need to close. Nobody? Okay. Stand with me. Let's go ahead and do the benediction because we are out of time. And uh, if the worship team can come, we'll close out with our song as people dismiss today. Sorry again, worship team. Um, yeah, we want to have a closing song every Sunday and we'll try and be more disciplined to, to get back in that routine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We pray you would help each one in this room to put fasting into their life in some way, at some level, so they can begin taking control over the craving of the flesh and over the dominance of Adam in their life, and that, Lord, they can become more like you, Lord Jesus, that their food is to do the will of God, not to have a nice juicy steak or a beautiful hamburger, but that our food, Lord, is to do your will. And that we can just walk away from the most beautiful meal if you've asked us to go do something and not care one bit because we're in control of our flesh. And so, Lord, bring that about in our church that we would grow deeper with you, that it would add a new dynamic to our prayer life and to our spiritual life. Bless each one today and help them and guide them into what's appropriate for each life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, say the benediction with me, if you would. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us. Amen. 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 We're going to close with the song, so begin singing the song, but Lizzie will come and dismiss row by row. And I need a couple ushers up here to help me give out uh, the handout. So there's one for fasting. If you missed the prayer one or the week before, then get that one also. All right. God bless you guys have a great day and a great week in the Lord.